Well, hey there. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. My name's Joe and I'm your local farmer. Uh, and today we're talking hay. So I wanted to just uh, share with you folks something that we do on our farm uh, in between our, our vegetable production. You know, between growing uh, fruits and vegetables, we do produce a little hay. Uh, it really is just uh, a means for us of reducing some of our feed costs for our petting zoo animals. And uh, it's something we've done for a very long time. Uh, I'm quite accustomed to it. Uh, I used to sell farm machinery and uh, the company I worked for specialized in hay production machinery. And so it's something I know quite a bit about. The thing about hay production is on the outside, it's extremely easy. It, most anybody can, can grasp the concept of what we're looking for, uh, what we're looking to, to accomplish. But the reality is that when you start getting into the scientific side of it, uh, the, the feed nutritional side of it, it's actually very technical and uh, very, you know, needs to be done with a whole lot of precision. So if I were asked by a you know, person interested in, in knowing what we do, Joe, can you boil down hay production into just a couple of words or maybe a sentence or two? Uh, on, you know, so that the novice could understand what are we trying to accomplish, okay? It's real simple. Go out, mow your lawn, let the grass clip clippings lay on the lawn for a day or two, let the moisture content drop below approximately 16%, it's kind of the number we're looking for, and then package it airtight so that air can't get to it on the inside and that's hay. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. What we're looking at doing is to cut grasses and some legumes, dry them down, package them, and, uh, and then store them for the winter time so that our animals can eat them all winter long. So as farmers, we're looking for grasses generally to raise for hay production. Uh, these are going to be things such as orchard grass, Timothy, rye grass, uh, you know, there's some Bermuda grasses, that kind of stuff, um, some grass called brome, and, and then also um, there's many of the cereal grains. You've got oats, uh, wheat, barley. I've heard of barley hay. It sounds kind of weird at first. There's a, a, a cross between rye and wheat called triticale, and, uh, and then also uh, we've got to be careful because if you just generically call it hay, you know, grass hay, um, you got to be very specific. Do you specifically mean grass hay only or are you just kind of using it as a general term, grass hay, because legumes are technically not grass. And of course, legumes, the first one that comes to mind is alfalfa, okay? A lot of alfalfa used, very high in protein, uh, very good feed. Now, in this field, this field, we have this stuff here. Let me see if I can get it right next to the camera. Now, it may not look like much right now. I'll show you some uh, fresh plants here in a second, but that's vetch. Vetch is a uh, another plant. It, it's uh, loosely related to peas, and vetch is also very high in protein. Uh, we use legumes primarily as a cover crop because they have a... Uh, unique capability of capturing nitrogen out of the air. Well, here I am in uh, one of our hay fields, or this is, you know, we intended this really as a cover crop field, but let me tell you what, did we ever get some nice growth this year? Look at this. I'm, just so you guys know, I'm six foot three, <laughs> and, and this stuff, this stuff is up to my armpits, roughly. It's got to be, oh geez, it, it's nearly five foot tall. All right, well first, we've got oats, okay? I don't know if you guys can see, but in this little husk, here, let me grab it, just a single here. In this little husk, that's what's gonna become an oat kernel in there. Now, I wanna check something here quick. Let's see if we can get it on film. Yep, there it is, there it is. It's, uh, <laughs> folks. I'm sorry, this is gonna sound disgusting. It's like popping a zit, okay? We call that being in the milk, okay? It's pretty self-explanatory. It means that there's milk in the kernel, okay? Let me do this one here, okay? Look, just squeeze it. 
Yep. It just squishes in my fingers, okay? Now, what that means is that the, uh, the oat kernel has not been formed yet, okay? Um, now, why is it important to know whether it's in the milk or not? Well, that's going to be a timing date, okay? Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether it's considered bitter for the animals or sweet. But the big thing is uh, it's going to have an awful lot to do with, uh, you know, protein percentage and stuff like that. So we're going to use that as a, ju a judgment date. You know, we're going to say, okay, we want, you know, we want it to, to, you know, barely be in milk or we want it to be in full milk or, or maybe the day after milk stops, which is pretty common. Okay. So we'll kind of use that as a judgment for the oats. Okay. Now over here on the side, right here, this beautiful little purple flower, that's vetch. Okay. Now, of course, I showed you that little wad of vetch that was uh, dried out, but here it is in its natural state. Okay. Like I said, closely related to peas. Um, in fact, let me see if I can find one. Oh, here we are. Here. Okay, let me grab this. Look at those little pods. Look just like a little pea pod or a bean pod. Okay. Now, one of the keys is, now I just, you can't see it. I have to kind of just describe it to you here. I'm able to crush them. Okay. Now, why is that important? I'll, I'll tell you, again, it has to do with date timing. Uh, actually, with, with uh, uh, vetch and alfalfa and things like that, we're going to use flour more than anything. You know, is it in flour or is it in bloom, I guess is what you'd say. Is it uh, prior to bloom? You know, things like that. But the key, I, I was able to squish that pod and feel it crush, okay? And that's very important, and I want to tell you why. Because there's a very fine line between growing a crop as a cover crop and creating a weed problem. <laughs> if we let it go too long, we run the risk of letting it go to seed. And next thing you know is we have a problem because we can't get rid of it. So if we take it off for hay, we're going to want to do it real soon. Uh, but even if we just use it as a cover crop, right now is the time. Otherwise, all of this seed is going to get what we say set, okay? It's going to become viable seed, and every bit that we plow back into the ground is going to be a weed, and we're going to have to fight that, okay? So more than likely here in just the next day or two, uh, we'll be coming in and, and uh, cutting this for hay, and I'll get some video of that. So I'm going to jump right into it, and I'm going to splice together some video of us cutting, drying, raking, and ultimately baling and hauling some fresh oat and vetch hay. Hope you guys enjoy it. This is our model 472 New Holland Haybine. The haybine is used to cut the hay off at the ground using a sickle bar and lays it into a windrow. But it has one other function that is very important for us and that is the conditioning rolls. Years ago a farmer would cut, a, cut his hay with a sickle bar mower and then have to make another pass through the field with a separate machine called a conditioner that would bend the stalks and open the fibers of the hay up so that they would dry faster. New Holland combined those two functions into one and that's how they came up with the word a bind. This is a view of the wobble drive that's responsible for driving the sickle bar in and out at a very high speed. And these are the conditioner rolls that squeeze and crimp the hay, making them dry much faster than they would without. And here's a view from the driver's seat. Well, you may be asking, Joe, why are you 
kneeling on top of your haybine here. And it's because I was cutting this field <laughs> and uh, went to make this corner right here. And as I made the tight corner and uh, the outside of the uh, haybine has to swing backwards, the uh, bottom conditioning roll, let me see if I can show it to you right down here. Bottom conditioning roll uh, wrapped up with hay. And that's why I've got my pocket knife out right now is I've got to cut that thing. I've got to cut the hay out. Oh, got to cut the hay out with my knife. And uh, that's why we always say, <laughs> anybody that comes to work on the farm, you get yourself a good pocket knife because you're going to use it a lot. And uh, <laughs> I, I got to tell you guys, unfortunately, this is the part of farming that you just can't, you know, it, it's a little more hard to share with people. A lot of people see all the, you know, the rainbows and the, the pretty red barns and the, the sunsets in the evening. They don't see this part. You get down on the, get down on the ground, get your pocket knife out and start cutting. So uh, hopefully I'll be up and running here in the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Now I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that this funny looking piece of machinery was designed by a guy named Ted. We call this a tedder. That's spelled T-E-D-D-E-R. And a tedder is used to loosen the hay up, fluff it, let it land gently on the ground, where the air can blow through it and dry it much faster. We call this tedding, and I've also heard it called tedering. Either one is probably correct. Here my dad is raking with our New Holland 256 side delivery rake. This is a ground driven rake and New Holland gave it the name the Roller Bar. This rake was designed back in the 1960s I believe and in fact they sell that same model rake today nearly unchanged some 60 years later. This is our model 273 New Holland baler. It's an old baler out of the mid 1970s, but it seems to run really good for us. It's not really fast, but it's been pretty dependable until now. To form a bale, hay is picked up by the pickup fed by the cross feeder into the bale chamber where the plunger slams it to the rear. Here if you look closely you can watch the knotters tie. When the length rod reaches the top of its stroke it'll engage the clutch and the knotter cam gears will spin. The needles come up and feed the twine to the back side of the knotters. The knotters will form a knot and cut the twine off, preparing for the next bale. Well guys, thank you for watching my video on our hay production. But before I go, I wanted to share something with you. Um, kind of the same thing as I did in the middle of my video on running the hay bind where I stopped to show you the 
you know, the, the plug that I had when I wrapped up uh, hay around the conditioner rolls. Um, the reason I do these videos, so the reason I'd like to do these videos and do many more of them is to share with you um, both the joys and the heartache of farming. Um, it has its ups and it has its downs, that's for darn sure. So let me tell you a little bit about this field that I'm standing in. If you guys remember, this was the very field that I used to show you the standing grain that we we're going to cut, the oats and the vetch that we we're going to cut. Okay. Now, through the miracles of video editing, that was the first day I was here. It was the day I, I videoed all of the uh, raking and the bailing, and then I came out here and did the introductory uh, video. And then in this very field where I'm standing uh, is where I shot the. Um, you know, the video about the grain and the, the, the oats and the vetch, okay? That week that we baled that hay, we had beautiful weather. Uh, the The coldest day, the high was in the, uh, the mid-80s, and the hottest day was about 92 degrees, all with a nice east wind, which means extremely low humidity. From cut, rake, bale, uh, I think it took us about three days uh, to produce some really nice high-quality hay. Okay, not the case with this field. Okay, when I came into this field and I showed you the, the grain and I said, this is ready to cut, we need to cut it within the next day. Then the weather turned off bad. Uh, it was cold weather, rain in the forecast. You ask any farmer, do you want to get hay rained on when it's laying down on the ground? No, you do not. You'd much rather just, you know, it's, it's the question, do you want it to be more mature or get rained on in the windrow. And uh, and really we just made the, the decision, let's just let it go, let it, let it get more mature. Um, and from the day I filmed that video, I didn't cut that hay, I think for another six days. It's just what we had, you know, it's what you deal with, okay? After that, we had more rain. It's now been another, I think another four days, I believe, maybe five days, since we cut the hay and I'm now out here tedding it or tethering it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I've got to, I hope you guys don't mind me saying this. That's farming for you is, uh, you just take what you get and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, that's the joy of farming, I guess. So hope to see you guys soon. If you have any, uh, uh, interesting ideas for future videos, please let me know. Leave a comment below. Uh, please like and subscribe if you get a chance. Uh, I hope to do these hopefully about every other week. So uh, hopefully you'll see a whole lot more videos in the future. Thanks a lot and have a great day.